Good afternoon. Did you enjoy your vegan lunch? Yeah? Well, I'm here to try and hope that you're going to have vegetables to eat in 20 to 30 years' time. Resurrecting food security for Africa. It's an ambitious title. And I actually don't claim to know how to do that. But what I do propose is to use resurrection plants, pictured here, as models for production of genuinely drought-tolerant crops, which I think will go towards securing food security for us in the future. Now, why do I say this? The world population is currently 7 billion people. By 2050, we'll be 9 billion people, and the bulk of this growth is going to be in Africa. The Food Agricultural Organization of the world suggests that we need to increase our current agricultural productivity by 70% to meet this demand. Now, given that plants are at the base of the food chain, most of it is going to have to come from plants. And people working in this field think that this is a really tall ask. And they haven't really even taken into account the potential effects of climate change. So this next slide is taken from a study by Dai, published in Nature, 2011, where he tried to take into consideration all the potential effects of climate change and expressed them in various ways, one of them being the increased aridity as a consequence of lack of rainfall. And what you're seeing, all these areas in red, are areas that until this point in time have been successful agricultural areas. But because of infrequent and inadequate rainfall, we can no longer grow crops there. The situation in 2050 is going to look like this. Our country, sitting at the base of Africa, and perhaps much of Africa, is in dire straits. We really are going to have to make some drought-tolerant crops. Until recently, this hasn't been possible. And in order to explain that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about life on this planet. All living organisms, from microbes to humans, are comprised predominantly of water. All life actions happen in water and require water and loss of a small amount of water results in death. You and I are 65% water. If we lose 1% of that water, we die. And so too for most animals. Plants, well, they're about 95% water. And because they're stuck in the ground and can't move away to go and get that drink, they tend to be able to lose a little bit more water than you and I, between 10 and 70%, depending on the species, but for short periods only. Now, most plants will try to either avoid or resist water loss. And classical or extreme examples of resistors are succulents or valvicia. These plants hold on to the water at great cost and grow really slowly. Examples of avoidance are things in trees and shrubs. They send down deep roots, they mine subterranean water supplies, and rather like a straw, they kind of suck it up at the bottom and flush it out at the top keeping their tissues hydrated along the way. And it's estimated that a, a single eucalypt can lose up to 10 liters an hour into the atmosphere on a hot, dry day. Another very successful avoidance strategy is shown in annuals. And again, an extreme example, perhaps ephemerals. For much of the year up our west coast, we don't see much vegetative growth. But come the annual rains, you see this blooming of the desert. Now, the strategy of annuals is to actually grow only during the rainy season, when there's enough water and the temperatures are conducive for vegetative growth, plant growth. Now, they survive all the other periods of the year by producing, at the end of that growing season, seeds which are alive but dry, between 8 to 10 percent water. And we call this property of being able to lose so much water without dying, desiccation tolerance. And in this desiccated state, seeds can survive extreme environmental conditions. So in nature, those seeds would lie in the soil, wait for the next growing season, and the whole cycle starts up again. And it's a hugely effective strategy. We've been using it for thousands of years in our agriculture. In fact, the bulk of our um, food production comes from annuals predominantly cereals. And it's a great strategy. But the downside is that there is little by way of inherent resistance, avoidance, or tolerance mechanisms in annuals. They don't need them. They only grow in the rainy season, and they provide seeds 
to help them survive for the rest of the year. So despite considerable effort of agricultural concerns to increase all of those characteristics, we still have images like this. Maize, two weeks without rain, and the crop is dead. And until recently, we haven't really been able to breed much by way of tolerance, true tolerance characteristics into our crops, because we haven't really known what it takes for a plant to lose a lot of water and not die. And I tell you that there are such models. We call them resurrection plants. These plants can lose 95% of their cellular water, remain in the dry and dead-like state for long times, months to years, depending on the species, and yet revive and continue growing when it rains. Now, these things, rather like seeds, are desiccation tolerant, and it's extremely rare. There are only 135 higher plant or angiosperm species in the world that can do this. Most of them occur in our country. Now, my fundamental research over the last 21 odd years has been aimed at gaining a comprehensive understanding of the mechanisms of desiccation tolerance in angiosperm resurrection plants and in seeds. In fact, I'm going to show you that there's a lot of similarity between what seeds do and resurrection plants do. The ultimate applied aim of my research, of course, is to put those key protectants into crops to make them more drought tolerant. Now, I work on a, a number of different species. I'm showing you pictures of only four, because those are the ones I'm going to talk about today, in their dry and hydrated states in the natural environment. And the reason why I work on a number of them is that each serves as a model for a crop that I want to make more drought tolerant. So to give you an illustration, Erogrostis nisdensis, shown here in its natural state, is a model for its close relative, Erogrostis teff. It's a highly prized pasture grass in our country, but in countries like Eritrea and Ethiopia, it's been the staple food source for many thousands of years. The seeds are eaten, they're small, but they're highly nutritious, and whoa, they're gluten-free. So the whole world has woken up to teff as a superfood. And yeah, I agree, it is, even if they got the spelling wrong. <laughs> so in order to get a comprehensive understanding of desiccation tolerance, or how plants cope with extreme drought, I've undertaken what we call a systems biology approach, in which you look at everything from the molecular level through to the whole plant ecophysiological level to understand these processes. At the molecular level, I look at changes of things like the transcriptome, which is just a fancy word for saying, what are the genes switched on in response to drought? We look at the proteome. What are the proteins made in response to drought? Proteins are the workhorses of the cell, so it's really important that we look at these. We look at the metabolome, and you've probably got it by now, the metabolite responses by drying. Another word for metabolites is plant chemicals. Now, I said before, plants are stuck in the ground, and in order to cope with particularly their environmental stresses, drought, cold, insects, herbivory, pathogens, they make themselves an arsenal, chemical arsenal, to survive. So it's important that we look at this. And finally, of course, we look at the lipids, for many and varied reasons, but one of which is that they actually act as signals to turn on genes. We do things like look at the changes in the tissue as they dry down, we use physiology and biochemistry to understand the function of the protectants that we think are protectants. And in turn, all of that, we try to understand how this plant then copes with all the stresses of its environment. And I've always had the philosophy that I need a comprehensive understanding of what's going on in order to take meaningful suggestions for a biotech application. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of you in the audience saying biotech. Is she going to be making genetically modified crops? The answer is yes, I am. But the point is, I'm actually starting with crops that are so highly genetically modified anyway by classical breeding, and we consider them safe to eat. I'm going to give you an illustration of maize. The original ancestor of maize is a little plant called Teosinte. 7,500 years of conventional classical breeding has resulted in modern maize. It's also resulted in millions and millions of gene changes. Chromosome doubling, trebling, gene duplications, gene reversals. 
ultimately a highly genetically modified plant from its ancestor and yet considered safe to eat. Modern biotechnology allows transfer of a small amount of known genetic material, you know what it's going to do, into a place accurately determined, the results of which are very quickly tested and reversed if need be. It's actually a hugely safe technology, if appropriately and ethically done. It's the inappropriate use, mainly for financial gain, that's given this field of endeavor a really bad name. So what am I going to do to make crops more drought tolerant? Two things. The first thing, photosynthesis. In my opinion, one of the most important processes on this earth. It's the process whereby plants having pigments called chlorophyll, which is the green in leaves, are able to convert sunlight energy to absorb it and then to use it to convert it, to convert carbon dioxide taken in from the air, water taken up from the soil, into carbohydrates and oxygen. Carbohydrates provide the energy for plant growth, which we need for our crops, and oxygen emitted to the air we need for respiration. So it's important if you're making a drought-tolerant crop that you actually make sure you protect photosynthesis. But sadly, it's quite a damaging reaction because there are three places where things called reactive oxygen species, another name for free radicals, form quite naturally. Now, reactive oxygen species are highly dangerous if they get out of control, and normally they're mopped up or kept under control by antioxidants. In this little cartoon, I'm going to show you three places where it happens quite naturally during the process of photosynthesis. First place is where chlorophyll absorbs light energy in the first instance. Second time, when water gets involved. And the third time, when there's a protein called ferrodoxin that's been reduced. Now, under well-watered conditions, these free radicals are just mopped up and the plant goes along quite happily. But under drought conditions, there's a massive increase in reactive oxygen species or free radicals forming. And the antioxidants in most plants just don't cope anymore. So how do resurrection plants prevent this? Well, they do a number of things. But the, one of the important things that they do is they actually stop that light chlorophyll interaction anyway. What I meant to say is that plant death happens if you don't stop these free radicals forming. So what they try to do is to stop that light hitting that chlorophyll molecule so that you actually don't get the downstream free radicals forming. And they do this in one of two ways. They either hide the chlorophyll from light, and I'm going to illustrate this in two plants. This is, these are the hydrated plants, dry plants. This little species at the top here literally just folds its leaves all the way up over the inner leaves here, forming a little cap. These are all shaded from light. The only surfaces remaining exposed to light are the bottom surfaces of that outermost rosette of leaves. And you can see they go quite purple. That's due to the accumulation of sunblock pigments. The bottom species here folds its leaves up against the stem. Again, the outer surfaces exposed to life remain, go purple, they go brown, they go waxy. If you actually cut across that leaf, you can see that there is still chlorophyll there, shaded from light. And if you look at the chloroplast, which is the organelle that is responsible for photosynthesis, that's the hydrated chloroplast. Those are the dry chloroplasts. They look pretty same. They're well protected. So the moment this plant gets rain, it opens up its leaves and it starts to grow within hours. You'll see that soon. The other strategy is to literally just get rid of chlorophyll, as shown in this little species. And the graph here shows chlorophyll content in a fully hydrated plant at 100% water and the chlorophyll content at 10% water. They've got rid of it. They all go one step further. They break down those thylakoid membranes. They break down that chloroplast so that there is no chance to photosynthesize. And it's a hugely effective strategy. These plants can stay in the dry state for much longer than the ones that just try to hide the chlorophyll. But importantly, it's a strategy used when seeds dry down. Now, my research has shown that there's a hang of a lot of similarity in what seeds do and what resurrection plants do. So we asked the question, are the same genes being used? Or put in a different way, are seed genes being turned on in roots and leaves of resurrection plants? And through a whole lot of transcriptomic and genomic studies, and we have just finished sequencing the genome of one of these resurrection plants, my group at UCT, together with a recent collaboration with people from America, 
the Netherlands and France have decided that yes, this is exactly what's happening. There are a core set of genes in all seeds, and I'm going to illustrate this for maize, that are switched on when desiccation tolerance is induced in their tissues. These same genes are switched on in roots and leaves of resurrection plants. Now, in modern crops, they have all the genes in their roots and leaves. They just never switch them on under drought conditions. They switch them on only in their seed tissues. So what we're trying to do now is to understand all the environmental and cellular signals that resurrection plants use to switch on these seed genes and to mimic that process in crops. I'm going to end by showing you the resurrection process in these three species. Just to remind you that this first one is the one that breaks down its photosynthetic apparatus, so it's going to take slightly longer to recover. There's a time axis at the bottom so that you can actually see for yourself how long this takes. But when you watch the video, try and do what I do. I'm a farmer's daughter. Imagine your veggie garden resurrecting after a long drought. My plants and I <laughs> My plants and I thank you for your attention and we leave you with the resurrection blessing. <laughs>